Welcome, everybody, to another episode of the Shop Notes podcast. This is episode number 70. I'm your host, Phil Huber, joined with my other co-hosts, John Doyle and Logan Whitmer. On today's show, we're going to be talking about woodworking fads, shop organization and cleanup, as well as address a few listener comments. But first, a message from our sponsor. This episode is brought to you by Shaper Tools, makers of the Shaper Origin, the handheld CNC router that brings digital precision to the craft of woodworking. Tackle joinery, cabinetry, hardware installation, and more with both speed and precision. You can try it risk-free in your shop for 30 days. Visit shapertools.com to learn more. Welcome back. I know there was some question about uh, Logan's new promotion and whether he would still be joining us on the Shop Notes podcast. <laughs> Unfortunately. I thought he was going to do a spinoff podcast. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Where he's like a single father raising <laughs> three girls. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Is that he like did... what a spinoff would be? Yeah, uh, probably. Yeah, like the Joni it, Loves like... Chachi kind of thing. Yeah, mm -hmm. it would be it would be titled From the Stump. It'd be awesome. <laughs> I'd listen. Uh, okay. <laughs> There's no bad ideas here. Right. It's a safe place. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you're listening to this and you'd like to hear that podcast, let us know in the comments <laughs> below. Or if you have any ideas for a spinoff podcast for Logan. Yeah. I, I'd, I'd guess star in his podcast. <laughs> He just won't shut yeah. up. That's the title. Yeah. Yep. 24 hours of Logan. <laughs> uh, you guys all that know what Miller awesome. deals with. Yep. Mm -hmm. So I thought today we could address a couple of topics. One of them is uh, kind of a, a good one that we've talked about as a group offline from time to time and that's the idea of woodworking fads okay. and how easy it is for myself included to get sucked into a fad and you know why that is maybe some of the woodworking fads that you've gotten involved in yourself over the years um and maybe you've some you've held on to just because they ended up working out so I'm trying to start a woodworking fad with edge gluing plywood. So mm -hmm. yep. it's, uh, I think it's, it's catching on. Yeah. So it's just behind shade, John over his of... over his right hand uh, shoulder is mm -hmm. is a panel glue up that I have for a video project where I mm -hmm. where I'm gluing up some plywood. Yep. In today's market, I think it's this is the the climate that mm -hmm. that that's going to take off if it ever will. Yeah. Plywood scraps to panels. Right. So, I'm not hating on it. Yeah, I'm going to do it someday. Yeah, I'm writing an article for uh, for the interwebs for sure, on you know like what's the point, and maybe some tips and tricks for edge gluing plywood and why you would do it. So for example, the project that John has, or that's over John's shoulder, uh, I just needed a big plywood base because it's got a shop made tool that we're going to be featuring on a video edition video series, a build along series. And it's a thick plywood base, three layers, gets glued up, ends up getting painted. And I feel like that's one of those options where you can use some of those oddball sizes of leftover plywood, edge glue the pieces together to get the overall size you need. Once the paint is on and it's serving its purpose as a base, nobody's ever going to know. They're never going to know. Totally legit. Mm -hmm. It's like it's using everything but the oink. Yep. Logan's not a believer. Yeah, no, not yet. Not yet. He just needs like some woodworking I, influencer media personality to like push him over the edge. So right. as soon as Peter Follinsby or Chris Schwarz or Mike Pekovich start 
you know, Anne of all trades when she does a video on this, mm -hmm. then it's going down. Yeah. Yep. No, I, but this I, is where it started. I just think that this is like the shag carpet of the current woodworking <laughs> world. Like hmm. it might happen for a little bit. It shouldn't have, but it did. You come back 15 <laughs> years later, there's going to be Oreos in the carpet, you know? It's just. It's all cyclical. Uh, It'll come back around yeah. again. Right. Yeah. Some things are timeless, though. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then some things aren't. <laughs> you know what? I have another project. I have another project in the shop there by John where mm -hmm. I edge glued some it was that quarter sawn oak plywood that i got from brian nelson 780 years ago mm -hmm. when he moved on to better things or just other things and i've been trying to figure out what to do with it so i'm making a, a mid-century modern piece and the pieces that brian had were like nine and a half inches wide i needed panels that were closer to 18 Nine and a half, nine mm -hmm. and a half is close to 18. Right. So the nice thing is, is the way he had break, he had broken down those sheets is they were like basically right on the veneer seams. So when you look at the seams, they essentially look book matched. Mm -hmm. And again, it's one of those ways of using what's normally like the off cut leftover pieces of plywood and recognizing that they are still useful. Mm hmm. Yeah, because yeah, right, there's a lot of times when I'm like building stuff out of plywood and like ripping it into strips to get, you know, maximize the most out of it. And sometimes you're just left over with, you know, some thinner pieces that just aren't usable. So that's an interesting tack to take is like, you know, I can still use these strips that are nine inches or less and glue them up wider pieces mm -hmm. you know yeah so I, just to be clear i'm not saying that edge gluing plywood is not legit i'm just saying i would never do it because i don't i don't generally use that much plywood in my projects and i have been under the mentality of when i'm done with it throw it away go in the burn pile so mm -hmm. i just don't usually end up with that big a scrap so what you're saying really is that you're a plywoodist and you just don't want to use plywood. That's what I'm saying. No, that's <laughs> that's more a woodsmith thing, not really a pop wood mm -hmm. thing. Oh, oh, are we doing oh, this? Oh. All right. <laughs> Shots fired. Oh, I had to get that one in when I could. <laughs> uh, no, so I hate uh, it when you guys fight. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny because what actually like drove this uh drove this topic to my mind was i was out doing what you guys expect me to do this time of year i was out sawing this weekend and the guy that i was sawing for uh, we we sent what did i tell you guys like 15 oak logs to heaven on saturday mm -hmm. i mean we we cut a lot of oak mm -hmm. and he wanted all boards which is very odd most, I mean, it's not odd, but most people that go software want live edge stuff. And he asked me, uh, Dean and uh, uh, Tom said, you know, what do you, what do you think about the live edge stuff? And I said, oh, I think it's kind of a fad. Uh, and that's what kind of drove this, uh, me bringing this topic up today, because I have, for the last year or so that I've been running my Samba, most of the stuff I have been cutting myself or most of my own lumber I have been cutting into live edge stuff because I don't, A, I don't have a plan for it. It gives me most options on if I want to sell it, somebody could buy it as a live edge piece, or I can edge it for them on the sawmill, right? Uh, and B, I can go ahead and stack that log back up in log form and dry it like that. Then I don't have to worry about covering it. I don't have to worry about having a big base for it. I can just you know stack it and let it go um however i have decided that after going through one winter and thaw 
or one freeze and thaw cycle and a lot of my log stacks tipped over i've decided it's much better for me to have just a big stack of lumber um rather than a bunch of cut up logs uh, so right now i have started cutting everything into boards and then i have a pallet for well i have a uh, a big stack of oak big stack of walnut big stack of maple big stack of cherry and i just keep stacking on top of those till i need to make another pile um so you guys you know obviously george nakashima kind of kicked off the live edge movement you know a bajillion years ago do you guys think it's something that's gonna stick around for a while is it gonna be cyclical like john said where it's just gonna come back at some point uh what are your guys thoughts on it i would say it's a fad like i don't know how long fads last like how long was golden oak a thing that seemed like it was like for 10 years like the 90s and then it was cherry and maple were the thing and then so i don't know if it's like a 10-year thing or where it'll fade out for a while and come back eventually or it's hard to say so i don't know how much longer i'm going to call it cyclical but i think it could still be a fad even though it's cyclical i mean it's yeah it's like it's like denim jackets you know or Mm -hmm. birkenstocks or something like that where they kind of ebb and flow and i think there's always going to be you know because i think when nakashima started there were a bunch of copycats back then Mm -hmm. we didn't see it as easily because nakajima didn't have his instagram account set up very well so people didn't know about him yeah he missed the ball on that one yeah (laughs) yeah so but then i think it kind of faded away and then now we're we're kind of in the middle of it again Sure. And it'll probably go back down. But ever since he's popularized it, I think there's probably going to be a baseline level of people that are into that kind of thing, and they're going to stick with it. Sure. So I guess on on that note, do you guys see something like Live Edge as tacky or not your style? Or what, what are your guys' opinions on it? Like, personally, I will never dissuade somebody from building something ever if they want to build live edge right. go for it and i think it can be done very well but it's not my style mm-hmm. yeah no i definitely think it looks good in some um settings you know that that's out you know, people have in their houses it doesn't work in my house just in general but you know i like the look of it but i don't know it's not good yeah. for kids no. They just chew on it. <laughs> they burrow so. in the bark. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I, uh, I, I guess I would agree with you guys in that I, it's not really my thing. But as I've grown as a woodworker, I've been able to grow in my ability to appreciate good craftsmanship, even in stuff that doesn't appeal to me. Mm-hmm. And that was really, you know, we've talked about this in another in an earlier podcast where Logan, you and I have done some judging at the Iowa State Fair in their woodworking <laughs> competitions. And where this is going. Yeah, you know exactly where this is going. <laughs> and there's some stuff in there, you know, like there's a lot of turning. And I don't do a ton of turning, um, but I can see skill and ability both in the design and the execution there. Um, My big thing was intarsia, which is, which to me personally, and it's not a slam on anybody else. We all have our biases, but it looks like woodworking balloon animals. And (laughs) no offense, (laughs) but, but yeah, (laughs) right. However, Don't be offended by the offensive thing I'm about to say. Yeah, yeah. Uh, however, that's how that's what I always thought. But being at the fair, there were some folk there who nailed intarsia, and it was super cool. And I can appreciate what it went, what went into it to make those particular pieces. Mm-hmm. And they did, they did stand out, head, shoulders, belly button, above 
all the woodworking balloon animals. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I think, so, I think that's an interesting point that you make, Phil, because I, I would agree that myself, as I have grown as a woodworker, you're right. I definitely appreciate, um, other styles and just, I mean, craftsmanship in general, again, it doesn't matter if it is something that interests me and Tarjo is one of those things that doesn't interest me. Um, but mm-hmm. I can appreciate how much time and, uh, work something like that takes and skill. Um, you know, from a turning standpoint, I love turning. I mean, you guys know that thing. Everybody listens know that I have a soft spot for turning. And I love it. One thing that does not interest me in the least is segmented turning. There's guys that hmm. will, you know, oh, yeah. build jigs and glue up 3,000 piece blanks and then they'll turn them into bases. It just, I mean, I can appreciate it. And as long as it is well executed, it's beautiful. It has zero interest to me. Like, I just don't care to do it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, but I mean, segmented turning, I mean, even that, I believe can be considered to an extent a fad because it seemed like that was a big yeah. deal uh, recently. And I feel like, and it might be just what I'm seeing around. I don't see as much of it as I did before. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, would you say the same thing with um, furniture styles then? Oh yeah. Do you think yeah. furniture styles come in in the fads? Cause I mean, you, you guys know a lot of the stuff I build for my house is based off Thomas Moser stuff. So a lot of it's like kind of modern shaker style stuff, um, yeah. which mm-hmm. seems to be the in thing right now. Um, but the shakers have been around for, you know, long time. Yeah. So, well, I mean, that's a, that's a very good example because there was a while in Woodsmith where, I mean, we did a whole SIB on shaker stuff and, because that was all projects in the magazine. If we put a shaker piece on the cover, you know, those were collector's issues because they all sold out. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that that kind of waned after a while. Um, then we saw like a big rise in craftsman style pieces. And, you know, John mentioned the golden oak era, you know, where we did a variety of, you know, I, I remember an office, like a home office suite in oak and i got like one of the printer stands from it at one of the auctions because it was just going to get tossed in the dumpster and i mean it was a printer for the like fan fold printer with the little holes on the side because you put the paper underneath and it would get fed matrix printers yep yeah yeah Mm -hmm. um so we had um we had a whole line of that and it's just red oak yellow finish big roundy edges on it you know and if you look at it now like there's almost a classic vintagey look to it Is but there? shortly after shortly after that you know that that era looking at it it was like eh, you know what you can do with yeah. that you can burn it in the parking lot yeah so do you guys uh, you, you guys know that I'm the Lord of Tangents, so I'm going to go ahead and bring us off on one real quick. Bring it on. Are you guys, a, like, do you guys hold a uh, negative connotation of something like that in your head? Because to me, that Golden Oak era in the 90s, which, mm-hmm. I mean, that's when I grew up, right? Uh, I'm a kid of the 90s. It ruined, it kind of ruined Red Oak for me. Like, completely unfairly. <laughs> like, it's so completely yes. unfair. And I have, I've saw some red oak, and I'm like, God, this stuff is beautiful. Like, I, but I, whenever I see red oak, I just picture golden oak stain, polyurethane over top. Let's make it plastic. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I kind of grew up with that too, where it was like golden oak and uh, shiny brass fixtures and kind of, a whimsical country style type stuff was popular and and same. Mm -hmm. It's just kind of like cringy to me now, which makes me think it's like, I don't know if it's probably 20 years ago, early two thousands where stainless steel and, um, brush nickel. uh, Yeah. All that stuff was popular. Is that going to be my kids? Like, cringy style 
of like, <laughs> oh, gross, stainless steel and yeah. black countertops. And here's here's my theory of explanation on it that is yeah. totally based on nothing. I call it the grandma hypothesis. Mm -hmm. And that yeah. is if it was the stuff that was the furniture in your house as a kid, therefore owned by your parents, it's totally abhorrent to you. You will yeah. despise it and rebel against it and hate it. However, if it was the stuff that was in your grandma's house, super cool. That's the vintage. That's the vintage look that you want. Hmm. Yeah, I can. Maybe. I can. Maybe. I can relate to that. I think. Um, I would say I would go a little bit further back and go to like my great grandma's house because my my grandparents don't listen to this podcast. I don't even know what podcasts are. Like a complete mashup of junk furniture in both their houses. But my great grandma sure. now, she had some really cool vintage like shaker <laughs> and federal pieces. So it's like, yeah, yeah, I'm 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 on board with that, Phil. I like that. Yeah. But now ask your parents and your ask your parents and grandparents what they think of that furniture. Mm -hmm. That's and true. they're like seventy five cents yard sale. Yep. Yep. Hmm. I can see that. Interesting. So interesting. Yeah. So would I? I think another woodworking fad. Well. Am I going to beat up on radial arm saws two weeks in a row? Yes, I am. Radial arm saws, right? Am I right? <laughs> no, I was I was going to say They're classic. Biscuit. Yeah, I was going to say biscuit joiners. Did they kind of come and go? Or uh, yeah, and see, I was going to bring that up because when I edge glue plywood panels, I join them with biscuits to keep the surfaces flush. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I have a biscuit, a Porter cable biscuit joiner. I don't remember what the model is. It was one of their early ones. It's like the five, five, five or something like that. Um, that I inherited from my dad when he got a new one and I use it routinely. And, and I believe that that one is a fad also. And you can see that in the various, woodworking publications or um, even early uh, YouTube videos where you would see this big interest and explanation on biscuit joiners are the super coolest thing ever and will revolutionize woodworking. And then they've kind of fallen away. However, there are still, like I said before, that baseline of devotees that will stick with it. Yeah. Myself included. Mm -hmm. You know, I personally, I love my biscuit joiner. Um, I only use it for alignment like you when you're gluing up your nonsense panels. Uh, but <laughs> when I'm gluing up stuff, it's great for it's great for alignment. But yeah, I mean, yeah, I think out, off the top of my head, that's really the only thing that well, okay. Shapers kind of came and went, right? Not the Shaper origin, Shapers. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, you don't see yeah. Shapers <clears throat> much anymore. Is that because of the fall of raised panel doors from the Golden Oak era? Maybe. Yeah. Um, I don't know if just routers have been just gotten better that you don't. And they could be. Yeah, I don't know. They yeah. Don't... Yeah, because I know uh, the Woodsmith store here in town, when it, uh, for a long while, they had a pretty large selection of a variety of woodworking machines, all the way up, you know, from the like low industrial to the consumer models. And they always had a few shapers there and would sell them. And I just wonder, because somewhere in there is when there was, again, what you, I would think is, could be considered a fad is the like horsepower race in routers mm -hmm. you know you kind of started yeah. with the the black and decker uh elu porter cable routers that are what i would call like a mid-size router and then right after that was this huge arm race going up to these monster routers that were you know three and a half horsepower and 
about the size of Oscar the Grouch's garbage can and, you know, yeah. whatever. And now we're to the point where, I mean, I guess you could call it a fad, but because I've bought into it, I'll say it's not. We're kind of on the like downswing and like small routers are cool. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe they got uh, up to such high horsepower that wrists got snapped off and they're like, maybe we should go the other way. <laughs> You know, maybe our wrists aren't as strong as, as our fathers and grandfathers. Yeah. So we got to get yeah. smaller routers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, um, it's, it's evolution. I say th there has to be something to be said along this line for technology advancements, right? Like you would have never been able to mm -hmm. have it in a horse and a quarter router back in the eighties as small as a Colt yeah. today. You know, I mean, you just right. wouldn't have been able to have one because the technology wasn't there. But I think you're right, you know, and it, it's funny because some of it, I think, is probably a false sense of perception or a false perception on you need a big router to do something or you need a big tool to do something when you really don't. Um, yeah. You know, I. It, it, Especially as a I, hobbyist. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, as we. I mean, we're talking about fads, and a lot of fads are uh, brought upon us by either manufacturers or people that we see as um, uh, important people in the industry, right? So how many radial arm saws do you think the new Yankee Workshop sold? I mean, is that why a lot of people had new oh, right. had radial yeah. arm saws? You know? Um, I don't know. It's, Yeah. I don't know. It's just it's it's interesting to me how, as a society, a woodworking society, we say, "Oh, hey, look, Chris Schwartz says I need a five and a half or a number five four plane, so I better go buy one." You know, and and there's many people that prescribe mm -hmm. that, and mm -hmm. it's funny because, you know, being in the publishing industry, where we are writing books on how to do woodworking. Uh, it's just it's interesting that your own sense of how you work kind of transfers into those pages so you know all that being said i think there's validity to everything as far as furniture yeah. styles tools and stuff but just looking back in the last 30 40 years how stuff has changed and it's going to be interesting to see what comes and what goes um, I think another one of the, the fads I'm guessing is probably going to go away sooner rather than later is the whole river epoxy table type thing. What do you guys think? I thought you were going to say shop crocs. <laughs> no, that's not going away. <laughs> it's here to stay. That's here to stay. <laughs> if I have anything to say about it, my legacy on the woodworking world is shop crocs. <laughs> If I could get Crocs yeah. to make steel toe Crocs, man, I lived a good life. Yeah. Maybe we got to get him to be an underwriter for the show. Yes. Like footwear provided by Crocs. I want the the ones with the fuzzy liners then. Okay. That's what we're doing. I think Dylan has those. This is where we're going to go. I'm going to go all out. Yeah. He's got the fuzzy ones. I think he does. Hmm. Okay, but river what tables. What about ones that table? are fuzzy on the outside? Is that a thing? I don't think so. Oh, trying to get back on subject here. Oh, dang it! Yeah, I would say that the epoxy river tables will run their course, although they haven't yet, based on uh, the folk that are that we follow on our Instagram account. I, every mm -hmm. time I scroll through it, when I'm looking at it, it just feels like it's just one video of epoxy being stirred together after another mm -hmm. and again it's... there's stuff that's really well done and then there's stuff where it's just like wow we're doing that mm -hmm. i think part of it is just so mesmerizing to watch it be made it's just i don't know hypnotizing yeah seeing the little swirls and it's everything so i don't know yeah. Well, part of me wonders, like, how how will these river tables or epoxy tables, 
how will they age? You know, right? Like, it, yeah, it, I don't because they haven't been around for that long. So, how's it gonna look in thirty yeah. years? Like, is it still gonna be used, or is it gonna be epoxy? <laughs> won't break down. I don't think in a la- landfill. So, hmm. <laughs> To be handed down from generation to generation. Yeah, because well, I would wonder if it would yellow over time. Yeah, right. like UV's UV is terrible on stuff, and you know, call me a romantic or whatever you want, but like, there's something very attractive about a piece of furniture that has been used and loved over you know forty or fifty years. Like, if you have right. a nice dining room table that has had families grow up around it like it's a nice looking piece of furniture usually um i don't know i don't know how that i don't know how the river tables are gonna look after 30 years <laughs> i think the survivability would be in inverse proportion to the number of children in the house mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah probably i call that the doyle hypothesis yes I can test it out. <laughs> we can age something a hundred years in in two years. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, any other fads then? I, don't I mean, I'm sure I can come it's up hard with to some. say when you're in the middle of it. Yeah. You know, the one that I've seen that hasn't seemed to gone away yet, and it's probably more on where I spend my free time is the the log type furniture you know like the Mm -hmm. cottage in the woods bed that's made out of spruce logs that are just stripped down with bark and then they're tenon on the ends you know Mm -hmm. yeah the the cabiny type stuff Um, I see I've seen that forever I mean I've been going on fishing trips and hunting trips my entire life and I always see it I mean, whenever you go up to northern Minnesota, mm-hmm. go to Canada, that's what's in there usually. Um, and maybe yeah. it's just part of the the ambiance of the the cabin setting that people like. Uh, but that's kind of stuck around for a long time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's definitely – yeah, because I don't know. What would replace that in, in those settings? I mean, I, it'd be I, I weird don't know. if it's anything else. Yeah. So – that's know. true. Golden oak furniture. Probably like I think Adirondack nice. chair would fit into there. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Well, I think there's thinking about uh, our you know, one of our friends that we've we've worked with, Nancy Hiller. Uh, she does a lot of kitchens. And she does a lot of cabinetry. She does a lot of kitchens out of like the the fifties and sixties and stuff, which to me isn't generally the era that comes to my mind when somebody talks about restoring a house it, i guess in the middle of iowa our 50s houses aren't that cool usually uh, mm-hmm. but she does a lot of those um so like do, what do you guys think about cabinetry like white cabinetry right now is kind of the in thing or the um you know loud painted i don't maybe not loud but the painted the kitchen island where the rest of the cabinetry is a different color. You know, do you oh, guys yeah. think we're going to see that type of thing go through? I don't I really like the look of that um, type of thing. It doesn't, like we said, with kids, it doesn't work to have crisp painted things. No. <laughs> but I do like the look of it. And yeah, like you said, it's not really a thing here in Central. I don't know because we were hitting our like – heyday of building in the late 60s to early 90s so that's kind of like the classic <laughs> thing here but but yeah. i don't know i don't know becky that works with us doesn't she have like a kind of a 50s kitchen with yeah painted yeah. appliances and i think that's kind of cool it's quaint it's maybe it goes back to the the grandparent or great grandparent um hypothesis of of phil that you know, it's kind of, it's kind of cool, you know, but. Oh, and it, it, it completely could. I like I, thinking about it, you're right. I mean, again, going back to my grandparents, my grandparents' houses weren't anything. They were golden oak. But my great grandparents' house, they had, they lived on a, in a small town in Southern Iowa. And 
their cabinets were all hardwood painted like a mustardy daisy yellow um like thinking like i used to think oh this is disgusting now I'm like that was super cool i wish i could walk back into that house you know <laughs> i don't i don't think that they're i don't think that they're they're laminate countertops that were like creamy white with gold starbursts on it i don't think those were cool <laughs> but uh, yeah. their cabinets were super or the, cool or the boomerangs or yeah exactly yeah, yeah. so hmm. i don't know i mean what, avocado uh, appliances yeah well it's funny because companies started making painted appliances again right because that stuff is cycling back in yeah now, would you guys say that right. we have seen that cycle? Um, <laughs> I I always laugh when I see the the Facebook memes where it's like, you know, it's some older person chastising a younger person, and the younger person's response is, "Okay, boomer, you're the one that covered up their hardwood floor with carpet or with linoleum." <laughs> yeah. So have we have we seen the the that type of cycle come back with hardwood flooring you think because for the longest time houses were hardwood yeah. yeah and then they went to yeah i think we shag carpet edge glued plywood flooring mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's a thing yeah yeah i think we've i don't know in this some of the newer stuff that i've seen built i mean and our house was built in the 60s and same tore up the carpet there was oak hardwood floors underneath but you know the very common what a two and a half inch strip yeah oak but it seems like more there's more wood floors but it's more like the hand hewn look or weathered look like you know different yeah um you know artisan type wood yeah. floors rather Textured than that just floors. generic yeah mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. hand scraped or whatever yeah yep yep so that's something I actually I wonder got. if I tore up the wood floors if there'd be carpet underneath that there might be that would be pretty amazing yeah that would be awesome I'll just tear up a corner when I get home and see <laughs> <laughs> that's not how it goes well it's funny because I, I had gotten a request <laughs> over the weekend for that is if I could do tongue and groove flooring and I'm like mm, no but then I started thinking about it. A lot of the big sawmills around that I know that, that do a lot of lumber. I mean, they, they have that capability. Um, Bear Creek Hardwoods out in Adel, west of Des Moines. Mm -hmm. they, they have a couple different sawmills there. Um, and they also have a flooring machine. And they said that they are um, probably going to be adding a second flooring machine in there because they're getting so much requests for locally cut flooring, which is kind of cool to hear. Sure. You know? mm -hmm. People, people, I yeah. think are yeah. kind of valuing that local, local products versus going to Menard or Lowe's or Home Depot to, to get flooring. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you're getting a custom millwork mill, then? Nope. I'm guessing will be your next person. No. Nope. Not until like you I'm get, not into that. Not until you guys fire me. Not I need yet. another job. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> I met an, uh, an acquaintance of my father-in-law in Southern Missouri, and he started with a bandsaw mill and was got into it that way and then got into the forestry aspect. So he was managing forests for some of the property owners nearby and then using that as a way to feed the mill and then sell the lumber from it. And he added a kiln and then he had same thing requests for flooring so we ended up getting one of those uh molder planer kind of mm -hmm. combo machines that kind of buzzes it through all at once which are fascinating tools to watch oh yeah use. so yep so i feel like in a way in spite of the cost you know like lumber mills are a gateway drug they're oh completely yeah like without a doubt because you it's like the entry it's the entry point to this entire world it's like that wardrobe that you can right. climb through yeah all right so one other topic that i think i wanted to touch on today was 
Uh, and what started it was we did an episode for the show recently where we made a shop cleanup center um, that has uh, a roll, houses a roll of craft paper for protecting your workbench, place for some paper towels and a box of shop towels, shelves for all your sundries and accessories there. So I was wondering in your home shops and also because we had some company coming to our video studio this week, we did a clean out purge organizing of the Woodsmith shop and a spring cleanup of the magazine shop. What's your strategy for organizing your own shop or do you have one? Wait until it gets so bad that things are just toppling over on themselves and then like, okay, everything's going out. Reorganize. <laughs> so you it's get to life like, cycle. like hoarder stage and then mm -hmm. you just drop it back down. Right, right. And then just repeat the cycle. Okay. That's how I do it. Mm -hmm. And the same thing here at work. Just the the tipping point is when Becky freaks out and it's like, <laughs> it's like we got to clean. You're like, which is yeah. which is a lot more often here. Right. Yeah. So it's a shorter life cycle. Yeah. Mine so. is. Yeah. Our old studio building was by itself. We weren't down there as often as we are in this. Mm studio so and it was a bigger place to hide stuff in corners and mm, on dark and stuff dark like. yeah and dark just shove stuff back in hallways and yeah what were you yeah. gonna say logan i was saying my mine is uh, if you guys haven't noticed i'm sure you have i haven't podcasted for my shop in about a month month and a half there's a reason for that because i can't stand <laughs> to go in there right now <laughs> so usually I do I've talked about going through my own cycle with tools where I get so many tools that I just need to purge them and then I'll do a big purge and I do mm -hmm. that about once a year um, for actual cleanup usually I'm I'm terrible about cleaning up at the end of the day and I know that there's a lot of um, a lot of guys that uh, work not necessarily in their shop but at their own jobs uh, that's their, that's their daily routine is at the end of the day, they clean up everything. And I, as much as I would love to be one of those guys, I'm not, and I can't, and I've tried mm -hmm. to get myself to do it. So usually I will work clear through the end of a project and wade through the disaster in my shop. And then I'll do a big cleanup and then it will stay clean until I start my next project. And I can't stand, I cannot stand my shop being a disaster, which is why I'm not in there right now. So I will have to set aside a full day to go in there and clean. Uh, it, it drives me nuts, mm -hmm. like almost to the point where I think I should go get medication for it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I surmise that cleaning your shop at the end of the day is like stretching after you work out like nobody <laughs> wants to do that like i did the work i'm not gonna like you know go any further than that i'm done but you're gonna feel a lot better the next day if you just do it you know? yes that's exactly you have a lot more momentum i think in your shop if you had cleaned it and put everything back at the yeah. end of the day but i am not one of those person that yeah. would do that like logan no. that's like no no, so. I think I think that's the same as uh, not far from where I live was a uh, in a little strip mall was a Godfather's Pizza that we would frequent entirely too often as a family, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and at the other end of the strip mall was like a CrossFit kind of whatever you know boot camp kind of fitness center. And it was always crazy to me to be in there either picking up a pizza or when we ate in. When that was a thing um, to see like a class get out of CrossFit and like a dozen sweaty folk walk into the Godfather's pizza, get a couple of pitchers of beer and a bunch of pizza. Mm -hmm. and I think that's that's kind of how that's how it is. That's yep. a shop cleanup strategy. Just there you go. Do the fun stuff. Don't do the stretching. No. Nope. So. I've admired people like Chris Fitch 
uh, Steve Johnson and Mark yeah. Hopkins in our shop where they get to the end of the day and they just take, doesn't seem like it takes very long, but just a few minutes to kind of sweep where they've been working, kind of organize their shop, their space, their immediate bench space, kind of set some things up maybe for the next day and and are kind of ready for it. So, yeah. Well, to be, to be fair, that is part of their work day. Whereas I feel like a lot of my sure. time in the shop either in the shop at work or my shop here rightly or wrongly i feel like it's like stolen like secret shop time where it's like i'm in there trying to get mm -hmm. stuff done before <laughs> the family takes my attention away you know what i mean right. so if if yeah. it was my if it was my eight to five per se where i'm in the shop working on a project and that's my day then i think it would be a little mm -hmm. bit easier to get myself to do that um so. right and, and I know that yeah. I've I've talked to people where they're like, oh, I couldn't imagine. I could not imagine walking into my shop and having it be a mess from the last day. As I'm standing in their shop, looking around, thinking I couldn't work in here because there's so much stuff in here. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm the same way. It's like guerrilla woodworking. You can kind of just jump in do a tactical strike and then you're back yeah, out and then you're out. Like, yep. Yeah. Yeah. No time to clean. You're in, you're out. <laughs> Everything's there for when you need to jump back in again. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. See, cause I'll do that. I'll get my shop cleaned up and I'm thinking, you know, this is what I'm going to do to keep the shop organized, work out here, do whatever. But then before I come in, you know, just kind of just sweep the floor maybe, or mm -hmm. organize the bench. And that lasts for a little while. Mm -hmm. I think it's been lasting longer and longer because I don't feel like my shop's been getting that unruly. But you're right. You know, it doesn't take long before it's like, well, I need this in the house. So I'll run that inside and then I take it back out and don't really put it away. Just kind of set it down on an open spot. And mm -hmm. before you know it, all the horizontal surfaces are totally buried. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, I thoroughly clean my shop when I finish a project. So once every 14 years. <laughs> so, see, I I clean, I clean right. my at the end of every project, but there's it's usually a month or two span between those. Or, yeah. or if I yeah. know that I have somebody coming over, like if somebody's coming over to do like like Jack, I think the last person in my in my shop here was Jack Coyer doing photos with me for a Poplet article. My shop got cleaned then because I knew I was having guests over. That same thing we do in the video studio. Yep. Mm. So always have guests over and then you you'll have a cleaner shop. Yes. Cleaner in, house. In open shop. Yeah. yeah. Doors always mm -hmm. open. Yeah. Um, one advice I would give that you remind me of this week, Phil, because you, I think, emptied the dust collector is if you have a dust collector, empty it when it's half full. Because if you don't empty it when it's half full, you're going to empty it when it's one and a half full. <laughs> so, and it's going to be a lot messier. Yes. It's, oh, yeah. So be it, proactive. It's funny because I did that uh, last weekend, two weekends ago. I was in our shop over the weekend and I was thinking, man, this desk collector and we have a big, it's a big Oneida system, I think, in our, in our production shop. Yep. And yeah. Yeah. I was thinking this thing is not sucking worth a crap. Like this thing sucks. Get it? It didn't suck, but it sucks. <laughs> and so I went in to check it, and it was legitimately the barrel was full, and it was backed up into the uh, canisters. So I took everything apart, and I probably got aside from the one barrel I dumped. I probably got two more barrels out of the entire system. This was before we did our shop cleanup. And I was like, what oh, wow. the heck? Like we had a we had a nice little flashing light rigged up that would go off when we needed to empty it and something broke on that and we just never fixed it. But I think those are sound words to live by, John. Empty it when it's half full. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> All right, let's wrap things up with a couple of listener comments. These mm. come from our YouTube 
channel. So if you want to see what's going on on the Shop Notes podcast, you can always watch and listen on our YouTube channel or wherever you forage for your wild podcasts. Uh, first one is from Jim, who said, I had to laugh listening to the show this morning. I have two power saws in my shop, a radial arm and a bandsaw. My miter saw is a Nobex handsaw unit. I use the radial arm for dados, miters, bevels, and beveled miters. Most of the ripping is done on the bandsaw, and most cross-cutting is done with a distant handsaw. Your description of the sound of the radial arm saw firing up was pretty accurate, though. <laughs> uh, another one from Graham, who says, congratulations to Logan. Indeed. Power saw opinions in his background. High school wood shop in the mid-1960s. He had radial arm saws, shaper tables, jointer. One shop teacher sacrificed a thumb to that. And only a single table saw that students could use under very close supervision. He took a refresher course in the mid-1970s via continuing education, occasional ref refreshers since. Over the years, I have subscribed to every woodworking and home improvement magazine, now pared down to Woodsmith. Woo! <laughs> Many books and articles on file, both paper and digital dating back to the 1960s. I bought a Sears radial arm saw in the mid-1970s, and it has been and still is my primary stationary saw. Replace the motor once, zero injuries. I will not own a table saw simply because I have always regarded it as the most unsafe power tool ever made. And because of the number of injuries I have witnessed or know of. As for the chop saw, yes, I still use that early name for the miter saw, is a crude replacement for doing only one of the very many things that can be done using a radial arm saw. If I was 30 years younger, I would be leaping at the chance to work for the magazine. Many decades ago, I spent a year working in Cedar Rapids, and much of my wife's extended family is in Iowa, Nebraska, and Missouri. But in my early 70s, I still have the energy and desire to get to my workshop, but not much else. We're planning a big road trip that direction for next year, so I might like to drop in. Uh, I think we can arrange that, Graham. Stop on in. Another one from Don. A lot of discussion about miter saws, table saws, and even radial arm saws. But what about track saws? Good point. Mm -hmm. Maybe we'll have to talk about that in another week. Rick says, nice to hear more from John this week and to see, his, see Logan after his announcement last week. Logan is not going anywhere. We own him. <laughs> contractually oh. obligated to do this podcast <laughs> in perpetuity right and finally carl says for me the pleasure of making jigs is coming up with an elegant design one that solves the problem at hand does it well and is simple and easy to use too many people conflate complexity and flexibility with quality or elegance i prefer the one tool that does the job well like the traditional Unix approach if you're still into computers. By the way, I made a router table based on Woodsmith plans back in the late 80s and still use it. So there you go. If you have any comments, questions, or smart remarks, we'd love to hear it. You can leave those in the comments section below the video on YouTube, or you can email them to us at woodsmith at woodsmith.com. Otherwise, you can tune in next week for another episode of the Shop Notes podcast. Once again, we want to thank Shaper Tools for sponsoring this episode. They're the makers of the Origin handheld CNC router. Allows you to tackle joinery, cabinetry, hardware installation, and more with speed and precision. You can try one risk-free in your shop for 30 days. Go to shapertools.com. Bye, everybody. <laughs>